for the third section of my talk, um, here's Chicago in 1880. I wanted to return to the Nora story uh, about the part where she comes to America. And because when I, when I set out to write Nora's story, I didn't know I was going to bring her to America. I didn't really know that much about Norway, though. And as I was beginning to sort of imagine her story, I drove uh, my oldest son out to Carleton College in Minnesota for it was his freshman year, dropped him off. And then uh, my husband and I continued sort of driving west. And as we're driving across Minnesota, I was looking around. I have a sister that lives in Minnesota, so I know Minnesota pretty well. I'm looking around and I'm thinking, I know the Norwegian story here. I know what I know this world. So maybe I should have Nora come to Minnesota, which would make would mean that, you know, I, I would do a better job describing her life in America than maybe her life in Norway. Um, and what I wanted to do, though, was I've always been fascinated by the uh, pioneer story, the life that pioneers had on the prairie, uh, partly because as an adult, I've recognized that the children's stories we all read, the Laura Ingle Wilder books and things like that, really evade the harshness of that world. So in writing about, in, in terms of putting Nora out on the prairie, I wanted to bring a sense of Ibsen's eye for reality. And I really wanted to ground it in the historical truths and conditions but thinking of it the way Ibsen might have thought about it. He has this incredible ability to do things like come up with details that, that little details, but they suddenly reveal a deeper part of the story or these sort of almost micro interactions between people that strip away the pretense and, and you, the, the theater goer, can suddenly see a character in a new way. So I wanted to, tell the story of the Norwegian American experience on the prairie, but do it with Ibsen's sort of eye. And one of the first questions was, where would Nora immigrate to? Once I decided to bring her to America, and I will say when I was in Norway doing research, I would ask all the Norwegians, what do you think happens to Nora? And they would tell me all kinds of interesting things, uh, many of which I use as ideas to sort of uh, pepper the story. Um, and Yet, you know, after a while I would say, well, I'm kind of thinking of having Nora immigrate to America. And a lot of the Norwegians were a little horrified that I would take their Nora and make her an American. They were like, oh, wait a minute. No, she's Norwegian. She has to stay in Norway. I said, well, you know, <laughs> so many people were immigrating to America. That seems a plausible alternative, especially somebody like Nora, who doesn't really have a good, many good opportunities for work and, you know, She's looking for opportunity. She's looking for a bigger life. So one of the Norwegian immigration historians I interviewed, he did, he did like this idea of having her come to America, but he said, oh, you have to send her to Chicago. Chicago in the 1880s is very vibrant. It's such an exciting time. This whole Norwegian um, neighborhood and community is uh, really putting down roots and developing. But I, re and I, I I agreed with him, it was sort of a great idea, but it was not what I wanted to do in terms of Nora's character. And my book is really about how does she change as she goes through this journey? How does she become a better person? Because she's someone who is used to lying. She often manipulates people. She has a lot of sort of bad habits that are around, that have developed for her as a young woman in a world where she has very little power. and. I wanted to see if I put her in a difficult place and really stripped her down, would she come face to face with herself and, and be able to change and grow up more? So I didn't want her to send, send her to Chicago. I wanted to send her here. So I really felt that Chicago would have been too easy for Nora as a city girl. And I do have her get off the train in Chicago and look around and think, wow, yeah, I could do this, um, but that's not, by then she's already um, committed herself to a, a, a different position out on the prairie and so she goes ahead. So when, after I decided she was gonna go to Minnesota, I had to spend more time out there and I was hungry of course for, you know, looking for this kind of Ibsonian sort of detail. I was interested in both 
um, descendant stories, uh, just stories about the immigrants themselves and to hear what descendants would say about their families, immigration stories. And I was also interested in images of everything from tools to sod houses to things like that. So I decided that she would um, emigrate, that the, the family that she was with would settle in Lockheed Parle County. This is Lockheed Parle. Um, and it's a beautiful, uh, long, narrow lake in Western Minnesota. Now, I, as a novelist, when I was looking at the map, trying to figure out where to send her, and I stumbled across this, this place called La Quiparo, which is French for lake that speaks, I was smitten. I was like, oh my goodness, okay, um, here's a lake that speaks to her. And that becomes an important theme in the book. Fortunately, um, that area, this is uh, way out on the western border, just, you know, the, if you keep going west, you're in South Dakota. Uh, so at the time that Nora comes to America, which is in 1881, this area was still fairly sparsely settled because some of the places I had thought about sending her, like eastern Minnesota or even Wisconsin, were pretty well settled at that point and again would have uh, given her um, a lot of community, which I, I really was trying to get her out alone in a more, frankly, sort of desperate situation. So I thought pretty empty prairie was where she needed to be. So as I was doing my research, I ran across this um, image of a sod house in Lockheed Parle in that time. And I also found a sod house to go visit. Um, it was actually in South Dakota, but it was a very haunting experience. And everything from the smell of the soil inside the place, the, the, the way it felt like a grave almost with all that dirt and um, just a little bit of light, those kinds of details were what I really was looking for. It was incredibly primitive and I, I felt that for a bourgeois girl like Nora, this would be quite a shock. So I found all kinds of revealing details in my research. One of the, so one of the interesting places I went, now this building is an American Prairie Norwegian church, but this building is in Hamar, Nor Norway. It's at the immigrant museum there. And what they're doing is um, buying old historic buildings um, in the Midwest, American Midwest, and taking them apart, transporting them to Norway and rebuilding them. And in fact, when my husband and I uh, went to see this museum and talked to the um, curators there, we had to walk about a mile outside of Hamar to get to the place. And it was a little hilly. So we're walking along and it looks like Norway because it is Norway. And then we come over this hill and it suddenly looks like we're in Iowa or Minnesota or Wisconsin. Uh, and it was very interesting to sort of see. It really helped me understand how important the, uh, the migration story to America is to the Norwegian imagination, that this is very alive for them in a way that I did not know until I got to Norway. So let's see. So I, I went to a lot of museums. Here's one. Um, this was a photograph I took in uh, the county next to La Quiparo County um, in the town of Montevideo. And this is one of the um, prototypical Norwegian chests that they all brought, um, most families brought. Many of them were Rosemald. Um, this one is not some, but I've, I've seen many pictures of them painted blue with writing on them. Um, often uh, the family's name and the, the date that they came over. So all of these artifacts and, and treatises I, I found, well, I, I also spent quite a bit of time in the uh, Norwegian American archives at, at um, St. Olaf College. And that was fun because I could visit my son who was at Carleton and he started to think I was pretending to be writing a book about the Norwegian Americans and it was just an excuse to come to Carleton and have lunch with him. But um, in fact, I spent, I read many, many accounts. I also, I spent an evening with a Sons of Norway group. It was my first Sons of Norway meeting out in Montevideo when I was doing research about Lockheed Parle. 
And they were having, it was a, a group of women, most of whom were in their 80s, fairly small group. And they had um, blue vests with silver medals and, and, and little blue caps um, that were decorated as well. They were adorable. And after their historical program, they all turned to me. I was the only person in the audience who was not of their group. They said, who are you and what are you doing? And I told them, and then they sat with me for another couple of hours and every one of them told me their family's immigration story. And it was really interesting because many of them still lived on the original homestead uh, how, of farms that their great, 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 or great or great, great grandparents had founded. So that kind of detail was really helpful. Uh, and, and there were many, the many odd things I found in the archives. I found a, uh, somebody's dissertation, I think it must have been, that was a compilation of what people died of in every county in Minnesota from 1850 to 1900. And that was rather a horrific read. I can't believe how many people died of farm accidents. Oh my God, all, all of which were gruesomely noted. Um, but I could, when I had a character in the book that needed to die, I, uh, you know, I, I went to this book to see what was in the county of Lock Key Pearl that winter, and I wanted to ground it in the historical truth in that way. So, for the past 10 years, uh, Nora and Solvi have lived in my imagination. And I had no idea how far this novel would take me. In the end, I came away with a profound appreciation for the women of the 19th century who really started to fight both personally and publicly for equal rights and women's rights. And also for Henrik Ibsen, who understood what they were up against. Thank you. So, if you want to know a lot more about either the play or my work around this book, I have a website for the book, searchingfornora.com. I write a blog at least once a month. I, I, I wrote them um, once a week for several months and then I got too tired. So now I write a new one each month. Um, you can find them at the website. I also have something I call Nora's Journey, which is a photo essay. I have taken photographs of objects that show up in the book as if Nora had taken those photos and I pair them with quotes from the book and they're really sort of book teasers but it's kind of interesting if you look at them you can look at them all as a single photo essay show that's also on the website I the website has links to it has a synopsis of Ibsen's play it has links to um, the Gutenberg site where you can download free copies of the play uh, in any format. Um, I have a little essay sort of sprinkled about, and there are also some pages about, um, there's a page about what, what movies have been made of Doll's House and how it's been reimagined in different forms. There's also a page about other sequels that have been written to Doll's House, which is kind of interesting. There were a lot of sequels written right away, most of which made Nora go back to Torvald. So that's sort of interesting to look at. So anyway, go check it out, searchingfornora.com. And you can also find out how to buy the book if you want to. <laughs>